Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer, and today I'm going to be playing Command Northern Inferno, the standalone expansion pack for Command Modern Air Naval Operations. Northern Inferno's big addition is a campaign, which allows you to play linked battles, which wasn't possible in the original version of Command, and it also introduces a affordable price point for new people to join the game. Uh, the original Command Modern Air Naval Operations is $79.99 for the download, whereas Northern Inferno is just $19.99. You can add it into the existing Command game, or, as I said, it's also a standalone expansion, uh, which lets you get into the game and kind of get used to it and decide if this is a game uh, worth the investment for the main game. Uh, the game basically covers a hypothetical war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, or the Warsaw Pact, during the mid-1970s. So it looks at what I think is a more interesting time period when it comes to the Cold War, where maybe both sides weren't quite so far apart. The Western Allies often had, te had a technological advantage over the Soviets, but the 70s was probably the era where things were um, not yet so dramatically different uh, that the Russians would be at a severe disadvantage. You could say the same about the 60s, probably, but there really is a sense that uh, the Soviets kind of reached their pinnacle in the mid-70s, and then as the computer revolution really took hold going into the 80s, the Western Allies really pulled, pulled ahead from a qualitative standpoint. The Soviets always had the numbers uh, to, to counter the Western Allies, but nonetheless, uh, an actual conventional conflict was far more interesting in terms of a tactical uh, layout and a battlefield uh, example, uh, I would say during the 70s versus just kind of the human, the human wave um, reliance that the Soviets would have to have in an 80s conflict. So that's enough of me chattering here over the menu screen. Why don't we go ahead and jump into the game and take a look at it. So you can see here, uh, the first big option that's new is the campaign option. And uh, that is specifically for Northern Inferno. It introduces the campaign ability for the command series. You can see here it's a conflict that takes place between August and October of 1975, NATO vs. Warsaw Pact. And that's really what this expansion is. And you can see here... Looks like there's some kind of a frigate was sunk uh, while shadowing a Soviet submarine. Uh, the Prime Minister laid blame for the incident squarely on the Soviet shoulders and asked the Soviet Premier for an apology and appropriate reparations. Meanwhile, the Soviet uh, Poblerto, which is basically kind of their ruling body, uh, accused the Royal Navy of dangerous violations of international maritime law and has labeled the incident as a tragic but unavoidable. Both sides have placed their naval forces on full alert. So basically a um, tragic loss of life on a ship being sunk um, leads to uh, the increase of tensions on both sides. Um, so in the Norwegian Sea, the Stanvant Flotilla, Standing Naval Force Atlantic, has sailed from Fast Lane and taken a war footing in the vicinity of Genmeyer Island and assumed an anti-submarine warfare posture. Shortly after receiving news of the Gibraltar incident, all NATO forces have assumed the second degree of readiness and are now preparing for war. Uh, so a hypothetical conflict, again, looks like this happened in the Gibraltar Straits, interestingly enough, but we're up near Norway. Um, a um, hypothetical conflict is brewing, and that's the situation as we go into the campaign. Huh, that's a little bit weird. I'm not sure why, but for whatever reason, I can't find a way to make the um, kind of campaign intro video play. There's kind of a live action video that plays that gives you a summary of the situation, but nonetheless, it's interesting, it's cool, um, and uh, I think adds a lot of kind of production value to the game, but I can't record it, so there it is. Um, here we have the first scenario of the game. It takes place on August 7th, 1975. 2130 Zulu hours. We're in the Norwegian Sea here. We're playing as NATO, and the turn lasts three days, or the um, battle lasts three days. So, let's see here. We just get the um, kind of briefing overview that we already have. Gameplay tip NATO's underwater surveillance network will rapidly flood you with a large number of underwater contacts cluttering your map. Don't panic. Not all of them are enemy submarines. 
give the SOSIS operators little time to start identifying neutrals, biologicals, etc. The color of these contacts will turn green. You can use this time to start arranging your air patrols, give orders to your forces, etc. Once you begin having positive classifications of green, filter them out. Right click each of the desired contacts to select filter out. This will remove almost all visual information about a contact from the map except its icon, thus allowing you to focus on investigating and prosecuting any me submarines. Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll start the scenario here. You can see our orders. Um, direct multinational force to move into the Norwegian Sea at high speed in response to Soviet deploying in the area. So P3 Orion's uh, indicate subs are incoming. Friendly forces. So we've got a frigate, two frigates, destroyer, and a frigate. So three frigates and a destroyer. Um, We've also got a squadron of P-3 Orions, more P-3 Orions, and we think there's enemy diesel submarines as well as guided missile subs, which are Juliet's. The SSK stands for a diesel submarine. The SSG stands for a um, surface-to-surface anti-ship missile submarine, so they can launch long-range anti-ship missiles against your ships. Uh, some fast attack craft, which is what SSN stands for. Basically, it's a nuclear fast attack submarine designed to take out other subs and surface ships. Another surface-to-surface uh, -surface, um, guided nuclear missile sub, um, a Charlie 1, has SSN-7 Starbrights, and some Russian bear bombers. So our mission is to prevent the Soviet submarines from entering the North Atlantic via the Greenland-Iceland uh, Kingdom Gap, the GIUK Gap, um, to patrol designated anti-submarine patrol areas and prosecute all Soviet submarines. Areas are located to the ASW Patrol 1, 2, Divided sources are required to patrol the areas. Land-based air assets to assist. Okay. So, um, we can zoom in here. We can see the game is pretty much the same in terms of, um, you know, the previous command game. Um, there's a little bit of more fluidity to moving around the map here. You can use your... Uh, kind of your arrows on your keyboard. You can also use the right click on your mouse and you can scroll in and out. So, here's the situation. We don't have any contacts yet. Um, and we've got, obviously the red is hostile. That's that's Russia. Um, looks like we've got locks, which to me indicate we can't go into Russia. Um, some kind of no-fly zone, I would imagine, at this point. And I would imagine this... Um, I'm not sure what these green circles are. Probably range for our aircraft. So you can see here, surface group three units, we got some, um, so we got some different frigate groups here, then on the Norwegian coast, uh, we've got some SAM sites, and we've got an air base, let's see what aircraft we have there. Some P3 Orions, so we've got two of them. Trying to see if the game will give us any kind of. Oh, looks like we've also got some P3 Orions up in the air right now. So that's our situation. We can go ahead and start the game. We'll go up here and we'll hit start. And uh, we've got time playing now. So we've got. Whoa! Well, that just got busy. So we've got our SOSIS network, which are basically underwater sonar. Um, which are stretched throughout the gook or the gap are picking up all these contacts here and they're all unidentified contacts so they're all um, you know yellow that indicates that we're not sure if they're friendly we don't know if they're enemy we don't know if they're friendly they're basically unidentified and they've all got different speeds so this one's moving for example at one knot and apparently they're being classified as goblins and um, this one at five knots so we don't really know we get some information as we kind of hover over each one of these. Uh, this one's 131 feet below, 131 feet, 131 feet. Seems to be a common depth for them, or at least a lot of them. 262, 131, 253. I have to guess the 131s are probably all... Seven knots seems a little bit fast. I think. Nine knots. Maybe I'm wrong. Seems fast for like a biologic. 
Well, the game did tell us to give our unit some time to identify uh, these forces as either friend or foe. So we could do that. I think what we are, what we are going to do... I don't think anything moving at one knot is probably a danger, but I want to move these guys. We're going to go ahead and right click, and then what we can do is we can go ahead and plot a course. We can hit F3, or uh, we can, you know, left click on the map. I'm going to get our P3s kind of up and running. Maybe we can close in in some of these areas. I want to get closer to our task forces uh, to try and protect them if there are any subs. Um, certainly getting aircraft, air cover over our task forces uh, will be useful. So we can probably move things a little bit faster, like 15 seconds for real time. Again, trying to give our sonar operators some time for the directions of the scenario to, I, to classify things as either friend or foe. NATO eyes only. Proceeding flash. Sink land. All units assume a war footing. One hour ago, a NATO P or P-3C was shot down in the vicinity of Banka by Soviet MiG-23 Flogger. Any Soviet air surface subsurface unit is now considered hostile. The use of nuclear depth charges, surfaced air missiles, is authorized. Uh, nuclear weapons have been authorized. All right, so we are, are not wasting any time. We're just minutes into a war. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa let's slow down. Um, we're just minutes into a war, and, um, oh, I don't want to mark it as friendly. Let's just filter it out. So we've identified some objects as biologic, so all we have to do is our uh, sonar operators, you can see here they've classified them as biological, so they're green, they're neither friendly, enemy, or neutral, they're just biologic. So we can go ahead and we can right, or we can right click on the unit, brings up our options, and one of the options is to filter out. So we don't have to do this, but we can choose to filter these units out. So that way, they don't basically clutter our scope. Um, but yeah, we're just minutes in. Just minutes into a hypothetical war. And uh, already, um, the use of nuclear weapons has been authorized. That phrase reminds me of a Crimson Tide. Okay. So that leaves a couple of uh, potential hostiles here. I think we're going to want to get some additional P3s up. We don't have a ton of them, but we've got two more P3s here. So we'll go ahead and we'll get them off the off the deck. We'll launch them as groups. So we're gonna get them out. We got these two. Mark 46 LWT. We're gonna get those preparing to launch as well. So these guys aren't gonna be ready for a few hours. Um, I'm trying to see if I've got other aircraft. Given that we are at war, I want to try and get all my aircraft up. So again, you left click on the airport, and you can see here on the right, over on the right side, you get some information about the unit. You can get more information as well, so if we left click where it says land installation, it'll give us a whole, um, or could give us a whole breakdown of the, there you see it pop up, get a whole breakdown of the airfield, but it really doesn't matter to us. Uh, about what installations are, are here. Um, aircraft there. Doesn't look like any aircraft there. Okay. Unless I'm missing something. So we do have some SAMs in the vicinity, and then we've got a whole bunch of units here which are not classified as friendly or hostile. Okay, hostile contact confirmed. So you can see here our SOSIS network is um, confirming that we do have some hostile targets here. We've got a PLA-627A November, number six. So that's a November submarine. Um, we're not certain. Well, let's do this here. Let's take over this guy. Let's go ahead and get attack options. Attack target auto. We're gonna go ahead and left click. So our fighter aircraft is going to attack. I want to go ahead and cancel our movement toward our plotted course. There. So we are going to attack. You can see here we are closing in now. And we have a P-3 Orion, which is a turboprop aircraft. It has a magnetic anomaly detector on the back of the aircraft, uh, which helps it detect enemy submarines. It has a bomb bay and is capable of dropping torpedoes on enemy submarines. And... Um, 
We could manually control it here. We can take a look at its weapons by left clicking here. We can see it has eight Mark 46 uh, air launch torpedoes, and then it has 100 sonar buoys, um, and it's also got 40 active sonar buoys. So basically 100 um, low frequency um, kind of passive sonar buoys, and then 40 active sonar buoys. Not sure if we need that, given that we've already detected the enemy. So we're going to actually do that for both here. We're going to go ahead and cancel this one's plotted course as well. And we're going to give it attack orders as well. It's going to attack this other submarine, which we've, again, identified as hostile. Meanwhile, these frigates of ours are also going to move in and attack. Attack auto is just F1. You just click on the target you want to attack. And you can do that. So it looks like we've got a surface action group here as well. So we're going to let the computer handle the attacks. We'll see how this all plays out. Now Sono buoys are basically during the Cold War, the Allies or the uh, NATO Allies uh, put together a ring of sonar buoys kind of along the northern entrance into the uh, into the Atlantic. So if the Russians ever attempted to get their subs out, they could go ahead and get them out. Um, it looks like we've got a Cosmos satellite in here too. That's pretty neat. Um, I haven't used satellites much in the game. Um, but they do, they do exist. They are modeled. But anyway, um, they basically created a net of sonar buoys, which are basically little sonar objects that are in the middle of the ocean that can detect ships and whales and whatever else is moving through the area and um, it was a key advantage that the allies or the NATO allies had during the Cold War. You can see here our aircraft is moving in again we could give it manual attack orders but we're gonna trust the computer for now. So you see looks like we've got... oh alright so our aircraft has just flown by and dropped an act there uh, is this a passive sonar buoy? Yeah it's a passive one down toward the target, you can see this other submarine as well has been identified as hostile also. So we've got a whole lot of hostile submarines now in the area, um, as well as uh, some more biologics that have been detected. But for the meantime, we're going to focus on the attacks on this one target. So you can see this passive sonar buoy has kind of a search radius. This little green circle represents its ability to detect enemy um, contacts in that area. And we'll see here... Goblin, assessed as cast force sunk. So I accelerated a bit, but our aircraft came in. Um, I probably went a little bit too quick there. Sorry about the guys, but you can see it dropped. It had started with eight of these Mark 46 torpedoes, and it dropped two of them, and uh, we assess it as sinking the enemy submarine. So uh, report is that the P-3 has sunk the enemy submarine, and you can see that sonar buoy stays in the, in the water for a while, at least after the initial drop. It's still active, pinging away. I think maybe it's an act of painting away. I think it's a passive though. Let's take a look. Sonar buoy passive only directional frequency analysis and recording. Yep. Okay, so it's a late 1960s passive sonar buoy, as I suggested. So we'll go ahead and we'll speed things up again. We'll get things going. We sunk an enemy sub, so that's good. And you can see we've got a data link back and forth between the sonar buoy, so it kind of feeds information back to the plane. But it is kind of irrelevant at this point in time uh, for us. And then you can see here we're dropping another sonar buoy, and you can see the aircraft circling back around, dropping torpedoes on this enemy sub, and uh, not having a whole lot of success, actually, as we kind of accelerate. So dropping these torpedoes, but not having success, and it uh, looks like the aircraft has to turn back for lack of torpedoes. So that uh, sub driver is a little bit more skilled and successfully... Um, successfully resisted our torpedo attacks. Interesting enough. So now we're moving that surface action group back to those subs. I, I get nervous about sending subs and uh, surface groups after subs. I'd much rather send P3s. But... Okay, so we've got two more P3s. We've got torpedoes and whatnot. We've got them airborne. So again, we can just go ahead and we can kind of line these up at uh, the target that we think is the most dangerous, that Foxtrot. And we'll get things going here as these aircraft kind of fly off toward their targets. And actually, I think this sub is a little bit more of a threat. So we're going to turn this back. We're going to engage this enemy Charlie.
And you can see also here, 27 minutes, that means that's the last time we had contact on the sub. So we know there was a contact in this general area. We know it was hostile, but we lost the contact. And as a result, it's, it's out of date by whatever time is on the screen there. We're going to see if this uh, aircraft here coming back in can maybe uh, take out this Charlie sub here as it kind of closes on this surface group of ours. It's still in range of a passive sonar buoy. And you can see there it did. First attempt, sunk the enemy sub. At least that's what Intel thinks. It could be wrong. Keep that in mind. Uh, but it did manage to sink that enemy sub. So again, I think we'll move back and we'll try and hit this whiskey submarine. But again, it's in close to one of our surface groups. And I'd rather, um, you know, try and protect our surface ships as much as we can. So again, uh, the time will stop sometimes when you uh, have an event that occurs on the screen there. And this is just a really basic scenario as well. I know in one of the previous videos I showed kind of a cruise missile attack. This is kind of easy, point click. It's the first scenario in this campaign. I think there's like 15 scenarios, but there's a good deal of scenarios in this campaign. Things certainly get more complicated and more difficult as we move forward. Uh, but a lot of this is just kind of getting used to the, the interface here um, and getting used to playing the game. Uh, so that's you know perhaps why I've had an easy time getting some of these Russian subs here. As you can see, there are... Uh, we got it, I think. Maybe not. Still see a red icon. And I can filter out some of these things that show up on the screen as well. Yeah, it looks like it's still alive. Maybe I did it. All right, there we go. So we sunk that Foxtrot with our... Uh, air group, so we'll move to the next target. The Victor 2, which would be a nuclear-powered uh, attack submarine, a little bit more dangerous. Although the Russian nukes were fairly loud. Flash. Goblin assessed sunk. Okay. So our uh, P3s are doing their job, certainly. That's not... That's a Nimrod. So I guess a Nimrod was kind of an anti-submarine aircraft, uh, but it wasn't a P-3. It was a different type of anti-sub aircraft. So that's interesting. Anyway. Flash. HMSC Frazier's been hit and is sinking. All escorts are to continue an aggressive anti-submarine warfare action. Okay, so maybe that sub uh, got a torpedo off before our aircraft did, and it looks like the enemy... Uh, the frigate Fraser has been sunk, so so much for gloating about how well I'm doing. Um, lovely. Get these surface groups away. We don't need to... Well, in that case, actually, maybe we should go up after this northern sub to protect the remaining surface aircraft. Sunk. Yeah, get these damn subs. So again, at this point, it's kind of just me flying around and hunting for these subs. Now, this scenario is a little bit easier because, again, I do uh, know roughly where the enemy uh, subs are, thanks to my SOSIS network. Um, so again, this is certainly amongst any of the command scenarios amongst the more simple. This kind of gives you a flavor for the type of game this is. It's not a flashy game. The graphics aren't amazing, but they're definitely more than adequate. They're kind of... Um, reminiscent of the, the Harpoon series, and they're also... Well, it looks like there's a bear bomber. So we sunk another sub. I don't think we have anything we can take a bear bomber out with. I don't have any... I might have surfaced air weapons. Um... 
I do have automatic weapons, but it's out of range. So we've detected an enemy bear bomber, which could move in on our surface action group, and we don't have much we can do to stop it. We'll just have to focus on continuing to go after... Enemy subs. Trying to clean the seas up. But again, it's kind of, it reminds me of sort of those old command whiteboards or kind of blank, you know, blank screen whiteboard type things um, that you'd see in kind of CI, CICs, command, command and control areas. Um, which is kind of a neat little touch, I think. Um, look, oh, they're returning to base because they're low on fuel. Okay. You know, all these guys are continuing to hunt this foxtrot. So we've done quite well, I feel. Another enemy sub sunk. I feel we're doing pretty well, at least. Of all the targets that are on our screen, we've knocked out almost all of them. I was kind of planning to cut the video off here just because we, I think we showed a fair bit of what is in this intro scenario and maybe we'll look at some follow-on scenarios as well later. Um, I'm certainly not a command expert, but I do enjoy the series. It's a lot of fun. Um, but when it comes to being able to actually play competently, I would certainly say I'm uh, more than a noob. Um, I don't know the first thing about sub hunting either. So you can see here we're dropping sonar buoys, the um, computer's dropping sonar buoys to search for the target. It looks like it's acquired it. Now it's going to move in and drop some torpedoes until it uh, can sink it. But you can see here it dropped a pattern of three sonar buoys around uh, the target. And um, then ended up dropping, once it detected them, basically it dropped a triangle of buoys to give it a maximum area of coverage and then it found it in the middle kind of there in a convergence zone and then it dropped a torpedo in and destroyed it so it looks like we ended the scenario early and we won a major victory here you can see again this is a very easy scenario it's the first scenario in the campaign things are gonna get more difficult and more complicated but you can see here we sunk one november one charlie two foxtrots two whiskeys one victor and two zulus uh, we expended 16 or no, the Russians expended 16 generic acoustic decoys. Uh, meanwhile, the Allies lost a Sea King helicopter as well as the destroyer St. Lorient um, and expended some 12 Mark 46 torpedoes. Um, oh, we dropped 257 multi-purpose sub bombs. So 20 kiloton nuclear bombs. I didn't even realize that was on. It was probably on the Nimrod, not on the P3s. But we dropped two uh, nuclear depth charges which helped us to uh, kill the enemy. And um, there you go, major victory. So we could continue the campaign, in which case you can see here, it looks like there's a scenario uh, that take, takes place just west of um, the British Isles. Um, you can see here, Tans resume her nuclear deterrent patrol close to UK waters, but it's still in range of her assigned targets. Intel suggests that the passenger patrol area may be compromised. So basically, it looks like we've got to protect some uh, nuclear ballistic missile submarines here in the vicinity of uh, sort of Scotland and Northern Ireland up here. Uh, but we will save that perhaps for a future video. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and uh, until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching. Um, I appreciate you sticking with me throughout this uh, video. Again, I'm certainly no command expert, but uh, if you want to see more of this, let me know. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamers saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.